the Lord. Amen and amen and amen. Well, I want to pray and then let's just, are you ready for the word of God today? Yeah, amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to come together and worship you, Lord, and praise your name. Now today, Father, as we come before you, we're asking you now to speak into our life. We pray that our worship spoke to your heart, and now we ask you to speak to ours. Holy Spirit, it instructs us that you are the one that speaks. We can't listen and learn without you. So we ask you to speak the word to our hearts today, make it revelation and knowledge. I pray that if anything has been deafening our ears or blinding our eyes from seeing and hearing, that today, that through your grace and through your mercy, that you open them up so that the word can be revealed to us today to help us change, to help us grow, to help us recover and be restored. I pray that today that every word spoken will be received through love. And Father, every word spoken will be spoken through love. I declare that Amanda and I have the mind of Christ, that our tongue is anointed to declare your word. We'll do it with boldness and power and authority, but most importantly, rooted and grounded in love. Yeah. I declare that the seed of the word will be planted in our hearts. Deeper the birds can't steal it away, but it shall produce fruit in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen and amen. amen. So we're in this journey uh, on still this, this theme that we've been on about restoration and restore. And last year, the Lord put it in our hearts that res this was a year of restoration. And restoration means it's, it's a year of getting things back to the original uh, meaning or intent. And that's what the Bible has said about all of us are called to a ministry of reconciliation. And what that means is that all of us are called to grow in this relationship with God, right? Reconciliation, taking man, which was separated, taking God here, and now putting them back together. Reconciliation, if, if you're kind of my age or maybe a little bit older, you, you knew this thing about reconciling your checkbook. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is, is you're going and making sure that everything that you spent was entered in. That way you didn't bounce some checks, number one, and that nothing was taken out that wasn't supposed to be, right? You're ensuring that things are in order. And that's what God says here is we are called to make sure that things are in order to our original created intent. Amen not just to breathe air and to live and die, but to actually have a purpose that God gave us and to grow in that purpose. We're all called to grow in the things of God. So we've been in this theme of restoration for quite a while right now, but we're in this part of this theme called, the, it's about the calling, mm -hmm. what we're all called to do. People have taken this word calling and gifting and kind of mixed them up. We're all called to the same thing. Every single one of us, you say, what am I called to do? What am I created to do? You're called to the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. Putting God to man and man to God. Now, gifting is something that God gives as he wills unto people. Yes. So our gifting may be different, but it all comes from the same spirit, the Holy Spirit. Hello? So you don't have to chase a call in your life. All you have to do is know what you're called to do, and that is to grow in your relationship with God and help others grow in their relationship with God too. Very simple. You don't have to worry and wonder, what am I made for? You're made to grow in God and help others grow in God. Amen. Amen. Very simple. Now, God will gift you along the way to help you grow and help others grow. That's your gift. You, you, you see what I'm saying? As you go with your calling, your gifting will begin to come and grow along with it. You never try to go out and seek a gift. Right. Never go out and try to seek a gift. That's where people get led astray. That's where people, you know, get real weird on you is when they're seeking this gift, right? But see, your gift comes and it follows after the call. Hello? We don't follow gifts. In fact, the Bible says it's a perverse generation that seeks signs and wonders. Right. That seeks after giftings. Okay? And it also tells us that giftings follow those or signs follow, follow those right. who believe. That's right. Not the believer following the signs, but the signs follow the believer. Right. Amen? So you get things out of order because we like the supernatural, man. Come on. We got TV shows about it. We like to see things that we can't explain, baby. We want to see the glory, right? And it's there, but it's not for our spectacle. It's not for us to go like a circus. Right. It's there to help us grow in the calling. If we have all of that going on without getting people closer to God, it's done in vain. Right. It's going to glorify man rather than Christ. Right. Come on now. And how many times have we seen people who God gifted them along the way and they lost the vision of what it was about mm -hmm. and it became about them and they begin to hurt 
people all around them. Right. Right? Come on, you see it time and time again where ministers, they call it falling, you know, such and such fell today. Mm. But God anointed them and gifted them, and it was for reconciliation for to help people, but when it got about their gifting, mm. they forgot about their calling. Mm -hmm. You can't neglect the call. Everything we do should be to go towards our call. Amen. Amen. And so that's what we're talking about right now is the calling. Right. So last week we focused on the importance of guarding and protecting our thought life, if you remember. Not last week, the week before last. So even after salvation, it remains our responsibility to govern the thoughts that are allowed to take residence in our minds. Okay? After salvation, it is still our responsibility to govern the thoughts that we allow right here. Right. Because you can be a born-again believer, you can mm -hmm. love God, but if you have an ungoverned mind, your life can still look like your old life. Yes. The results in your life can still look like your old life. Come on. So one of the most ungoverned areas of our life is our mind. Mm. allowing our thoughts just to go wild. I put this down here, that my mind is a border to my freedom. Mm -hmm. You get that? Yep. My mind is a border to my freedom. Without me breaching that border, I'm never going to walk in freedom. My mind is what blocks my freedom. Mm -hmm. If it is an unrenewed mind, I have no freedom in Christ. Amen. So the border, the gateway is right here. The biggest battleground you'll ever fight is right here. Your mind. Thoughts that contradict the Word of God will become walls that hinder and stop me from walking in freedom and peace. That's how important it is. That's how important it is. And remember I said, whose responsibility is it to govern thoughts? Mine. It's mine. It's not your pastor's job to do it, right? It's Jesus gave you born again, right? But how do you know that we are spirit, soul, and body? You're born again spirit, but guess what? Your soul is still being renewed. Soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Amen. My mind, will, and emotions are things that I have to govern and submit to the Word of God. Because will means it's something that I choose to do. Right. All of us have choice. Today you chose to get dressed. Thank you. <laughs> right? You chose to be here today. Some of you didn't, but some of you did. You chose to come here today. You made a choice. God didn't make you do anything. Right. I mean, God said he doesn't even make you accept Jesus. Mm. He says, you come unto me, all you who are weird. He said, and didn't say, I'm coming after you. I'm going to come after you. I know we like to do that, but it's when we surrender is when things happen. Yes. Amen. So we have a choice. Our mind, our will, and our emotions have to be submitted to the word of God. It's a choice we do. Amen. You're as born again as you're going to be, but your mind can still be filthy. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 5. You want to read that? Sure. It says, take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Take captive every thought and make it obedient. Who is this talking about makes it obedient? Me. I have to take that thought and make it surrender to Christ. Amen. And that's where a lot, of, a lot of us fail, okay? I'm putting me in the same boat with you, okay? I'm, I'm not some super spiritual guy. I'm, I'm just, listen, God has given me a call to be a pastor. I didn't want it. I grew up in ministry. I've seen the good, the bad, and ugly of ministry, but I can't run from what God has gifted me and created me to do. I was miserable in doing it, so I said, God, I surrender to it, and that's why I'm here. Amen? And so I, I, I know 
that I'm, I'm nobody better than anyone else. In fact, I'll give you this microphone and you can do it. And I'd rather, I'd rather be a good number two than number one. That's just the right. way that I am. I'll be, a, and I know that sounded weird, but I'd just rather be a, a good supporter of the vision. I believe that you can't be a number one until you are a good number two. There you go. I, I do believe in order to be a leader, you must first learn how to follow. And I think that's true. Not just follow, but support, uplift, and gird the number one. Exactly. And we went through that season yeah. for many years. Right. And when this opportunity came, we don't have our, our clock, so I'm, I guess I get free time. Oh, yeah. Um, you want to start that clock up there for us, brother? I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I don't know how long we've gone already, uh, but not long enough. All right. So uh, <laughs> where were we before I interrupted us? Oh, yes. So we, um, we served a long time as assistants, and when we got this opportunity, I didn't take it lightly. No. In fact, I rejected it over and over and over again until finally I couldn't run from it anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'm here. I never want to put myself on a pedestal that I've got it all worked out, all figured out, and it's all, because that ain't me. If you're looking for that pastor, he's not here. There's plenty of other churches that have that guy, but it's not this guy. Mm -hmm. But this guy, this lady right here, we're, we're not in this for money. We're not in this for any games. In fact, if we were in it for money, we'd stop because the church doesn't pay us. Right. Okay, I work a full-time job. It's not about money. I've gone from third shift to come in this pulpit and preach. It ain't about my comfort. It's about what God created me to do. Amen. Okay, And that's all I am is simply a man that said, God, I'll surrender to, the, to your call and anointing. And that's all. So when I say stuff like this, never think that, oh, pastor, he's got it all worked out. He's judging me that I don't have. No. I battle my flesh every single day. Right. I have to battle my thoughts every single day. Okay? So when I'm talking about here, the battlefield of the mind is so real. I'm talking from experience. Yeah. Right. And then if I could, you know, I'm going to start in verse 3 of that chapter. Go ahead. Uh, because I want to know, you to know how important this is says, for though we walk in the flesh as mortal men, we are not carrying on our spiritual warfare according to the flesh and using the weapons of man. Yeah. The weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood. Our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Mm. We are destroying sophisticated arguments and every exalted and proud thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God and we're taking every thought captive the purpose to obedience of Christ, being ready to punish every act of disobedience when our own obedience as a church is complete. Why is it important for us to take these thoughts captive? Because that's where spiritual warfare enters in, is through the mind. Understand that. You are in a battle. Yeah. Constantly. Every day when you wake up, you're in a battle. Yeah. But here's the thing. We need to take those thoughts captive. What are they? Arguments, knowledge, thoughts. Every one of those are strongholds that enter our mind. We do not hold them captive. So here's the thing. Let's get an example. Okay, you're sitting there and you're rehearsing an argument you had with your spouse the day before. And then you go into further arguments in your mind. What you've done is you've entered in the battlefield and you're in spiritual warfare for your marriage. And you're allowing the enemy to take your marriage captive. Mm. Because you will not cast down those arguments. You will not cast down those thoughts. The same thing about the body of Christ. There are words that we could say up here that will pierce the soul. But if we allow the captives to take thought in our minds, the spiritual warfare that happens for the body. Think about that. We're in a spiritual warfare. So what thoughts do I need to take captive? Thoughts of blessings. I bless them. I don't curse them. I think they are wonderful. They are wonderfully made. That they are for my best interest. They love me as my father loves me. And talking about my spouse. Right? These are things that we've got to take captive. It's a spiritual warfare thing. The battle in my mind is spiritual warfare. I mean, you're, you're hitting on it, man. <laughs> That's pretty good. Right. 
And that's the root cause. See, a lot of times we see a problem and we just look at it on the surface. Right. And we assume there's the issue. And we do that with people. When somebody says something, does something, lets us down, all that, we go straight for the people. Mm. But the root behind it is not the person. There's something coming against your purpose. And you have to see the root cause is not flesh, but spiritual. There are many things battling for our mind. The Holy Spirit speaks to us through our mind. But you know, the enemy likes to infiltrate us through the mind as well. How dare we think that he can't infiltrate our mind just because we're born again? He can. He can. That's why you have to guard and protect your mind. So here's a little solution here. 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26 says, The servant of the Lord must not participate in quarrels, but must be kind to everyone, even-tempered, persevering peace, and he must be skilled in teaching, patient and tolerant when wronged. When When, wronged. When wronged. Patient and tolerant when wronged. He must correct those who are in opposition with courtesy and gentleness and the hope that God may grant that they will repent and be led to the knowledge of the truth. I'll be the first one right now to say I'm guilty of not doing that. I, I am a, a, a person who, who grew up defending themselves because of size and color because I was raised as a missionary's kid. And I didn't look like nobody, sound like nobody, so I I had to defend myself. So over time, my defense mechanism comes in. If I feel you are a threat to me, I take threats out. Mm -hmm. And if if I feel you're talking about me, I can talk about you to belittle you to the fact of where you never want to speak to me again. Right? And that's things that I had to battle after even I got rid of, or left that place, I would hurt even good people around me because of my defense mechanism when I felt like they were doing wrong. So instead, instead of me doing here, right. where I'm focusing on the good, right, and I, I'm responding with kindness and respond, even though I feel like I'm being done wrong, I respond biblically, I could have saved some relationships. And here's the thing what my job is. When that comes out in his nature, I have to remind him of the nature of Christ. And she's good at that. <laughs> Very good. You're, you're an expert at it. <laughs> and he has to do that in me as well, right? That's the relationship we have with the body, not just husband and wives, but we should do that with the body. Yeah. And remind each other when we start going into those rabbit trails and those arguments and those imaginations, and we need to remind each other that we are called together. And that we meant good for each other and not evil. And that's something that in in your relationships, whether your marriage or your friendships or whatever, when a friend comes that is wounded and hurt and they've got some issue with other people, instead of just coming in and starting to agree with everything they said, listen with the filter of the word and encourage them how to respond biblically. Right. Right? And how, how to resolve things biblically. With a gentle spirit. With the gentle spirit and things can work out, okay? But it takes both sides on that, but they can work out. There's one thing that my wife learned from somebody, I don't know where she learned this is, but a soft response turns away wrath. Mm -hmm. And there are times when I'm ready to just fight about something and she's just like, you win. He wakes up that way sometimes. uh, I'm (laughs) telling you, I mean, I'm that guy, right? So I tell you, I'm not the perfect guy, okay? I was very rough in the world and and God saved me. So if he can do it for me, he can save you. He can deliver you. He can take somebody and change your nature and and the way you respond and do things. It doesn't mean it doesn't try to pop back up, but I know that I have to surrender that thing, right, to to who God created me to be. But she learned somewhere that, you know, when I'm acting stupid, she's responding in love and she's not arguing back. And guess what I do? I finally give up. Because right? the joy of the Lord is my strength. Yeah. And it's, I, I can guarantee you it's not because she doesn't have something smart to say. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's not because she has no response and no thought about how she could tell me where to go. But it's that she learned something that, that really, I'm telling you, over time has taken our marriage to a different level. And it's even, it even what it did was it caused me to start recognizing when I was being that person mm-hmm. and, and try to work on me even without her saying anything. Mm-mm. That's what's, that's what's crazy about it. 
is, <laughs> you know, that she's helping me be a better me. Right. I'm the head of the, I'm the man of the house. So what? We're one. Mm-hmm. Right? We're one. I help her, she helps me. And that's the way our marriage should be. That's where your friendship should be. Every relationship you have should help you grow in this. Okay? And in relationships, I always teach this way. You should have different types of relationships. You should always be helping somebody up, right? And then you should always have relationships that help build you up. Right. Either way, if you don't have both of them, you're out of balance. Mm -hmm. It should be a constant, I'm helping somebody Mm -hmm. and somebody's helping me, okay? If I'm always down here and trying to just always help somebody, if I'm not careful, what I've been doing to try to help is going to end up hurting. It's going to pull me in the wrong it's going direction. It's going to pull me in the wrong direction. If I'm always just hanging out with people that are trying to pull me up and do this, I'll start to get arrogant and cocky and start to really get out of sorts too where well, it becomes can, about me. And then, then we'll take on shame. Yeah, and then, so at least. So yeah. have a balance in that type of relationship. Right. You should always be helping somebody. But you also allow somebody to help you, right? That's what, we, that's, that's what I encourage you to do in your relationships. Balance it out like that. So to finish that up, right. it says, in the hope that God may grant that they will repent and be led to the knowledge of the truth, which means accurately understanding and welcoming it, and that they will come into their senses and escape from the trap of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Repent, repentance and the truth, the truth of the word, are essential weapons in resisting the devil. Yep, absolutely. That's good stuff. Mm -hmm. Act like you hear the Holy Spirit sometimes. I don't know who you think you are. (laughs) I thank God for for my wife. And, man, she's helped me along the way a lot. And I pray that I've helped her encourage her Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And, and I thank God because there are times where she has to come in and remind me of the word. Okay? There are times where I'm not washing my mind like I should in the word of God. I'm not renewing my thoughts. I'm not casting down vain imaginations. I'm not assuming the best. I'm, I'm looking at the worst. And sometimes I need someone to help me, not be my Holy Spirit, no. but to be my partner to be my friend, to encourage me, not, not condemn me, mm-hmm. but to encourage me. And I want to tell you, husbands and wives, that's the thing is, they may, your spouse may need correction, but listen, you're not the Holy Spirit. Right. But guess what? We're all used by the Holy Spirit. So you encourage them and love them through it. And when they say, hold up, leave me alone, you finally say, okay. And then you begin to pray and look for windows of opportunities. The key is you drawing closer to the presence. Yeah. yeah. That's it. You draw closer to the presence. Let that change happen through you in his presence. Then it starts to rub off on them. Because when you're in his presence, you can't help but to exemplify and mirror him. You can't help it. It's in his presence. And when you seek, presence means face. And in the the Hebrew translation, it means heparin. It means face. And when the Jewish, the Israelites, they would come in and then they brought the showbread, it was in a circular pattern and it's a 360. And so they, when they brought it, it was el perum et perim. It means face to face. And so that's his desire for us, is us to be face to face with him. That's our heart cry. How can I be a minister of reconciliation if I will not get into his presence? How can I take hold of the captivity, the the battle of my mind, if I refuse to get in his presence? That's where my strength comes from. That's where the change, and and that's where the captivity happens. It's it's, it's, like I said, it's spiritual warfare. And if we understand spiritual warfare and the, the battle for our mind, where do I get my weapons? It's in his presence. I can't do anything separate from his presence. Because when I try to do it without his presence, I exhaust myself. I fail. I take on the battle and armor of shame and of disgust and disappointment and rejection and isolation. And that's not for us. No. 
No, it's not. No. Well, it's a trick of the enemy. It is. To get us into a place to where we separate ourselves and then we're vulnerable from the attack of the, yeah. en- of, huh. of the enemy. Very good. So take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ, right? That was the scripture, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Capture your thoughts before they overtake your tongue. Yeah. And there's a reason I'm saying this, okay? But capture your thoughts before they overtake your tongue. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. Mm -hmm. Because there's some things that go through your mind that don't need to be spoken out of your mouth. Amen. The person that you are dealing with, Mm -hmm. they don't know about that thought, but you let it out. Right. Right? You could be doing a million things right, but they're going to remember that one thing said wrong. That's right. We tend to do that. Yes. We tend to do that. We, we forget about the good and we focus on the bad. That's just the way our it. flesh, we rehearse that over and over and over and over. And that's what you got to take captive. Yeah. I've got to cast that down. I've got to walk in forgiveness. So you have to guard how you hear, mm-hmm. but you also have to guard how you speak. Yes. So as a listener, as a receiver, I have to guard that I receive in love. Yes. And as somebody who's speaking, I have to guard and make sure I'm speaking in love. Right. But I can't speak in love if I don't have love mm-hmm. in here and in here. Mm-hmm. Okay? But take captive your thoughts before they overtake your tongue. Listen to this. When my tongue has been overtaken, my life is being held hostage. Mm. I want you to understand that you and I reside in a spoken world. In Genesis, we see that the natural world became a reality through the spoken word of God. I mean, remember that. Mm -hmm. God said, he said, let there be light. And there was light, right? He spoke, there was. So the realm we live in is is really coming from the spoken word of God. Yes. Everything you see, you included, first came from the released word of God in, upon the earth, who brought order to chaos and brought fullness from emptiness. Okay? He spoke, it responded. So listen to that. We reside inside of a spoken world. Yes. Do you, do you get that? Yes. Right now, you reside in a spoken world. In Genesis, we see that the natural world became a reality through the spoken words by the Spirit of God. Now, in Proverbs 18.21, it says, we see that life and death are in the power of the tongue. There's something about the spoken word. There's something about the spoken word. We live in a world and a reality that came from God speaking. And I want to put this out before you based on life and death are in the power of the tongue. Here's what I present before you. The life that we live is a result of the words that we release. Amen. Okay? I'm not a blab it, gab it, grab it type guy. I'm not talking about that. No, no. What I am saying is you're not going to have a positive life with a negative tongue. That's right. Even the world tells you that. You're not going to have joy if all you do is speak hate. Huh? You're, you're not gonna you're not gonna feel like you are or have faith if all you're doing is speaking doubt. If all you do is speak fear in what you see, you'll never have peace. When the enemy controls my tongue, the enemy controls my life. Many of God's children are held as POWs because of their uncontrolled, unfiltered words that they speak. You know what a POW is? Prisoner of war. 
Pastor Amanda just said it a minute ago. We're in a battle, a spiritual battle every single day. But some of us get held prisoner in that war because of what we're saying. And as a believer called to a body, when I see one of my brethren held captive, it is my responsibility to go into the war room and to speak into that battlefield and command those angels to go into the war and to speak the word, the identity of Christ, the thing that had taken them captive, speak against that over them. Don't condemn them with your words. We speak You know, a country, a country doesn't condemn prisoners of war that have been taken captive. No. What they do is they fight for their freedom. That's right. But how come in the kingdom of God, when somebody gets captivated or they come in as a prisoner of war, they get offended, they get hurt, they do something crazy, we tend to isolate them and judge them and, and just speak about them. Write them off. And write them off instead of fighting for them for That's their right. freedom. It happens time. I've seen it, man. I grew up in church. Mm -hmm. Okay? I've been involved in church for 45 years. I've seen the good and the bad and the ugly of it. How many prisoners of war have we left abandoned because we didn't go into the rule room, surrender our hearts, and pray over that situation? Isn't it time that we stop allowing the enemy to take our brothers and sisters captive on our watch? Especially when... They feel like we're the ones that put them in captivity. Amen. God forbid. Our life is too short. Our purpose is too big for us to leave people behind. Amen. Especially if we've done something to captivate them. And I hope out of anything that I lead you by example, that I'm willing to surrender myself for the purpose of the kingdom Amen. before my pride of saying I'm right about something. Amen. Because God's call is greater than my ego. Amen. We've got just a few moments. First Peter chapter, I guess 3, verse number 10. Whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. Amen. Matthew 15, 11 says, It is not what goes into the mouth of a man that makes them unclean and defiled, but what comes out of the mouth. This makes a man unclean and defiles him. All right. How about Matthew 12, 36 and 37? But I tell you, on the day of judgment, men will have to give account for every idle word, inoperative, non-working word they speak. Mm. Verse 37, for by your words, you will be justified and acquitted. And by your words, you will be condemned and sentenced. Well, I thought no condemnation were those who are in Christ Jesus. Every man, every woman, will stand before God and be judged on your words. Amen. So some of us need to dig up some seed. Yeah. But see, the good news is, is listen to this, the good news is if we have a repentant heart, That's it. God never holds our sins against nope. us. Amen. And what she's talking about is there's some seed we may have planted. Yes. That we just got to say, God, forgive me for planting those seeds. I realize how important they are. And God, right now I'm turning away from where I've made mistakes. We all make mistakes. The Bible says we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. The only one who hasn't is Jesus. Jesus. Remember, he's the standard. So anything that deviates from him is wrong. And we need to get back to the standard. Amen. Friend, I want to tell you something. No matter what's gone on, what you've said, listen to this. 
You can have forgiveness. Yes. You can have freedom. You can have restoration. Yes. Through Jesus Christ. So today, you may have planted some seeds. Mm. There may be some things said right here in your relationship. It's going to be up to you to uproot those things and make some things right. Amen? Because we don't want strongholds. No, no, not at all. I want nothing to divide this relationship. I want nothing to divide this relationship. And we should all fight for that. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do. We all have this thing right here. I got more to talk about on our tongue. This right here controls your life. Amen. James goes into it real good. Oh, yeah. When it talks about your tongue is like a rudder of a ship that directs your life. Amen. Then it goes back to the proposal of this thing that I put before you. You're residing in the life that you have spoken. Yes. Amen? And if you want your life to change, you got to change what you're saying. And if you want to change what you're saying, you got to change what you're thinking. Hello? Amen. And if you want to change what you're thinking, you got to change how you're receiving, seeing, hearing. Amen. they got to be filtered. Amen? Was that good today? We're going to call it a day on that. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. I hope you learned something today. I hope it encouraged you. Maybe it wasn't so much you learned something, but you were reminded of something. Maybe it was some small thing that could help you. You've heard something like this before, but one small thing can help you grow. I'm sure we all know that we just can't say, some, say anything without repercussion. And here's a reminder. You're going to be tested in it this week. Oh, yeah. You're going to be tested in it. Welcome the test. Welcome the test. Welcome the test because it's a growing moment. Yep. Look, I'm going to welcome this test. This trial is going to come, and I'm going to welcome it because I'm going to pass the test. I'm going to grow in this. I'm going to grow in this to where I cannot be held captive, and therefore I'm ready and have that tool of ministry of reconciliation to bring freedom to those captives that I see in my life. See, what this is, is what you've just heard is something you can either put faith in yes. or reject. Yes. But if you put your faith in what was being said today, it will be tested. Yes. First Peter, we talked about it in the link team meeting. First Peter talks about that there are going to be testing and trials of your faith. But when your faith is tested, mm. okay, your faith is protected by the Father. Yes. Okay. And it said it's, it's more precious than gold, the refining of gold. So you take a test that comes on what you're learning and you're having faith in, and you don't reject it. What you do is accept it and say, work out of me the issues and refine my faith where it's strong and pure. That means get in the Word. That's right. Get in the Word and get speak the Word. Get in His presence. That's right. So when somebody comes at you this week, does something to try to hurt you, you say, welcome. I'm walking in love. Welcome. I'm not returning. Welcome. I've washed my mind. I welcome it. And when you try to rehearse it, cast it down and say, you know what? That's not going to hold me captive. It's a different way to see. Yeah. It's about the perspective. Yeah. And how you perceive this thing in life. Amen. Because everybody out here you may feel is out to harm you. So what if they are? You've got the one to protect you. That's right. So that's when you can tell the enemy, I don't care what you throw at me. You're not changing my faith, my purpose, my destiny, my dream. You're not changing me. I welcome it because my faith is being refined. Amen. So stop looking at your enemies as your enemies. It's not the natural. What it's doing is it's refining my faith. Amen. Come and do what you're going to do because you're not wavering the course. Amen. Don't get me to start preaching because I'll get on that one too. <laughs> because Amen. I want to tell you my course has been wavered too many times because of people. And the moment that I said, God, I don't live for people, I live for you. That's right. Is when I could become straight and solid. Yes. But there's going to come a time in your life where you've got to stop depending on the approval of man. Amen. And start saying, God, all I need is your approval. Amen. All I need is you. Now, it's good to have some man, you know, I'm talking about it's good to have some folk. I'm not talking about just, Lord, I want everybody to be ugly to me. No. <laughs> but when I say, Lord, it doesn't matter. 
You're protecting my faith Amen. through your word. Yeah. Amen? Let's stand to our feet today. Listen, you may be here, or you may be watching. You say, Pastor, I hear you talking a lot of good stuff today, but man, who is this Jesus you're even speaking of? You can never have freedom without Christ. If you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today can be your day. Right now you say, Pastor, I've never accepted it in my heart. And I want to make that change today. I need Jesus. I need freedom. I need that peace you're talking about. If that's you. If you're here, you can lift your hand. We'd pray with you. And if you're watching and connecting right now, what I want you to do is to reach out in the comment section. Say, hey, that's me. I need somebody to pray with me. We're going to reach out to you. The Bible says it's real simple. We talked about the power of words and faith words. It says, if a person would believe in his heart that Jesus is the Son of God and that he's the Savior, and that if he would confess his, with his mouth in faith that he is the Lord, then he would be saved. So believe in heart, confess with mouth. So not only did our world that we live in come from spoken words, but the salvation of your life comes from the spoken faithful words of your mouth. That's how important it is. So we just want you to repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. That Savior is Jesus Christ. I ask you to come into my life, to be the Lord of my life. I want a relationship with you. I repent. I turn from my old ways. And I want to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord one more hand clap of praise. I want to pray over you before we're dismissed. We'll be at the back, Pastor Man and I. Love to shake your hand. Love to talk to you if you want. We, you don't have to. You can head on out of here. Listen, we want to eat too. So anyway, but we want to be available for you if you need us. But let me pray over you. Father, I thank you for every person here. I call them the head and not the tail. Above and not beneath, Father God. I thank you, Lord, they're blessed and everything they put their hands to, they prosper. I thank you, Lord, that they're coming up, they're coming out. I give you praise and glory, God. I thank you, Lord, that we are watching what we think, so we watch what we say. I praise you, holy, mighty name. Amen and amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.